karaoke books. Ivanhoe. Written by Walter Scott. Audiobook. Chapter 3. Then, sad relief, from the bleak coast that hears. The German ocean roar, deep blooming, strong. And yellow-haired, the blue-eyed Saxon came. Thompson's Liberty. In a hall, the height of which was greatly disproportioned to its extreme length and width, a long oaken table, formed of planks rough-hewn from the forest, and which had scarcely received any polish, stood ready prepared for the evening meal of Cedric the Saxon. The roof, composed of beams and rafters, had nothing to divide the apartment from the sky excepting the planking and thatch. There was a huge fireplace at either end of the hall, but as the chimneys were constructed in a very clumsy manner, at least as much of the smoke found its way into the apartment as escaped by the proper vent. The constant vapor which this occasioned, had polished the rafters and beams of the low-browed hall, by encrusting them with a black varnish of soot. On the sides of the apartment hung implements of war and of the chase, and there were at each corner folding doors, which gave access to other parts of the extensive building. The other appointments of the mansion partook of the rude simplicity of the Saxon period, which Cedric piqued himself upon maintaining. The floor was composed of earth mixed with lime, trodden into a hard substance, such as is often employed in flooring our modern barns. For about one quarter of the length of the apartment, the floor was raised by a step, and this space, which was called the dais, was occupied only by the principal members of the family and visitors of distinction. For this purpose, a table richly covered with scarlet cloth was placed transversely across the platform, from the middle of which ran the longer and lower board, at which the domestics and inferior persons fed, down towards the bottom of the hall. The whole resembled the form of the letter T, or some of those ancient dinner tables, which, arranged on the same principles, may be still seen in the antique colleges of Oxford or Cambridge. Massive chairs and settles of carved oak were placed upon the dais, and over these seats and the more elevated table was fastened a canopy of cloth, which served in some degree to protect the dignitaries who occupied that distinguished station from the weather, and especially from the rain, which in some places found its way through the ill-constructed roof. The walls of this upper end of the hall, as far as the dais extended, were covered with hangings or curtains, and upon the floor there was a carpet, both of which were adorned with some attempts at tapestry or embroidery, executed with brilliant or rather gaudy coloring. Over the lower range of table, the roof, as we have noticed, had no covering. The rough plastered walls were left bare, and the rude earthen floor was uncarpeted. The board was uncovered by a cloth, and rude massive benches supplied the place of chairs. In the center of the upper table, were placed two chairs more elevated than the rest, for the master and mistress of the family, who presided over the scene of hospitality, and from doing so derived their Saxon title of honor, which signifies, the dividers of bread. To each of these chairs was added a footstool, curiously carved and inlaid with ivory, which mark of distinction was peculiar to them. One of these seats was at present occupied by Cedric the Saxon, who, though but in rank a thane, or, as the Normans called him, a Franklin, felt, at the delay of his evening meal, an irritable impatience, which might have become an alderman, whether of ancient or of modern times. It appeared, indeed, from the countenance of this proprietor, that he was of a frank, but hasty and choleric temper. He was not above the middle stature, but broad-shouldered, long-armed, and powerfully made, like one accustomed to endure the fatigue of war or of the chase. His face was broad, with large blue eyes, open and frank features, fine teeth, and a well-formed head, altogether expressive of that sort of good humor which often lodges with a sudden and hasty temper. Pride and jealousy there was in his eye, for his life had been spent in asserting rights which were constantly liable to invasion, and the prompt, fiery, and resolute disposition of the man, had been kept constantly upon the alert by the circumstances of his situation. His long yellow hair was equally divided on the top of his head and upon his brow, and combed down on each side to the length of his shoulders, 
it had but little tendency to grey, although Cedric was approaching to his sixtieth year. His dress was a tunic of forest green, furred at the throat and cuffs with what was called minever, a kind of fur inferior in quality to ermine, and formed, it is believed, of the skin of the grey squirrel. This doublet hung unbuttoned over a close dress of scarlet which sat tight to his body. He had breeches of the same, but they did not reach below the lower part of the thigh, leaving the knee exposed. His feet had sandals of the same fashion with the peasants, but of finer materials, and secured in the front with golden clasps. He had bracelets of gold upon his arms, and a broad collar of the same precious metal around his neck. About his waist he wore a richly studded belt, in which was stuck a short straight two-edged sword, with a sharp point, so disposed as to hang almost perpendicularly by his side. Behind his seat was hung a scarlet cloth cloak lined with fur, and a cap of the same materials richly embroidered, which completed the dress of the opulent landholder when he chose to go forth. A short boar spear, with a broad and bright steel head, also reclined against the back of his chair, which served him, when he walked abroad, for the purposes of a staff or of a weapon, as chance might require. Several domestics, whose dress held various proportions betwixt the richness of their masters, and the coarse and simple attire of Girth the swineherd, watched the looks and waited the commands of the Saxon dignitary. Two or three servants of a superior order stood behind their master upon the dais, the rest occupied the lower part of the hall. Other attendants there were of a different description. Two or three large and shaggy greyhounds, such as were then employed in hunting the stag and wolf. As many slow hounds of a large bony breed, with thick necks, large heads, and long ears. And one or two of the smaller dogs, now called terriers, which waited with impatience the arrival of the supper. But, with the sagacious knowledge of physiognomy peculiar to their race, forbore to intrude upon the moody silence of their master, apprehensive probably of a small white truncheon which lay by Cedric's trencher, for the purpose of repelling the advances of his four-legged dependents. One grisly old wolf-dog alone, with the liberty of an indulged favorite, had planted himself close by the chair of state, and occasionally ventured to solicit notice by putting his large hairy head upon his master's knee, or pushing his nose into his hand. Even he was repelled by the stern command, down, balder, down. I am not in the humor for foolery. In fact, Cedric, as we have observed, was in no very placid state of mind. The Lady Rowena, who had been absent to attend an evening mass at a distant church, had but just returned, and was changing her garments, which had been wetted by the storm. There were as yet no tidings of Girth and his charge, which should long since have been driven home from the forest and such was the insecurity of the period, as to render it probable that the delay might be explained by some depreciation of the outlaws, with whom the adjacent forest abounded, or by the violence of some neighboring baron, whose consciousness of strength made him equally negligent of the laws of property. The matter was of consequence, for great part of the domestic wealth of the Saxon proprietors consisted in numerous herds of swine, especially in forest land, where those animals easily found their food. Besides these subjects of anxiety, the Saxon thane was impatient for the presence of his favorite clown Wamba, whose jests, such as they were, served for a sort of seasoning to his evening meal, and to the deep draughts of ale and wine with which he was in the habit of accompanying it. Add to all this, Cedric had fasted since noon, and his usual supper hour was long past, a cause of irritation common to country squires, both in ancient and modern times. His displeasure was expressed in broken sentences, partly muttered to himself, partly addressed to the domestics who stood around, and particularly to his cupbearer, who offered him from time to time, as a sedative, a silver goblet filled with wine. Why tarries the Lady Rowena? She is but changing her headgear, replied a female attendant, with as much confidence as the favorite lady's maid usually answers the master of a modern family. You would not wish her to sit down to the banquet in her hood and kirtle? 
and no lady within the shire can be quicker in arraying herself than my mistress. This undeniable argument produced a sort of acquiescent oomph. On the part of the Saxon, with the addition, I wish her devotion may choose fair weather for the next visit to St. John's Kirk. But what, in the name of ten devils, continued he, turning to the cupbearer, and raising his voice as if happy to have found a channel into which he might divert his indignation without fear or control. What, in the name of ten devils, keeps girth so long afield? I suppose we shall have an evil account of the herd. He was wont to be a faithful and cautious drudge, and I had destined him for something better. Perchance I might even have made him one of my warders. Oswald the cupbearer modestly suggested, that it was scarce an hour since the tolling of the curfew, an ill-chosen apology, since it turned upon a topic so harsh to Saxon ears. The foul fiend, exclaimed Cedric, take the curfew bell, and the tyrannical bastard by whom it was devised, and the heartless slave who names it with a Saxon tongue to a Saxon ear. The curfew, he added, pausing, I, the curfew, which compels true men to extinguish their lights, that thieves and robbers may work their deeds in darkness. I, the curfew, Reginald Front de Buff and Philip de Malvoisin know the use of the curfew as well as William the Bastard himself, or e'er a Norman adventurer that fought at Hastings. I shall hear, I guess, that my property has been swept off to save from starving the hungry banditti, whom they cannot support but by theft and robbery. My faithful slave is murdered, and my goods are taken for a prey, and Wamba, where is Wamba? Said not some one he had gone forth with girth? Oswald replied in the affirmative. I? Why this is better and better. He is carried off too, the Saxon fool, to serve the Norman lord. Fools are we all indeed that serve them, and fitter subjects for their scorn and laughter, than if we were born with but half our wits. But I will be avenged, he added, starting from his chair in impatience at the supposed injury, and catching hold of his boar spear. I will go with my complaint to the great council. I have friends, I have followers, man to man will I appeal the Norman to the lists. Let him come in his plate and his mail, and all that can render cowardice bold. I have sent such a javelin as this through a stronger fence than three of their war shields. Haply they think me old, but they shall find, alone and childless as I am, the blood of Hereward as in the veins of Cedric. Ah, Wilfred, Wilfred! He exclaimed in a lower tone, Couldst thou have ruled thine unreasonable passion? Thy father had not been left in his age like the solitary oak that throws out its shattered and unprotected branches against the full sweep of the tempest. The reflection seemed to conjure into sadness his irritated feelings. Replacing his javelin, he resumed his seat, bent his looks downward, and appeared to be absorbed in melancholy reflection. From his musing, Cedric was suddenly awakened by the blast of a horn, which was replied to by the clamorous yells and barking of all the dogs in the hall, and some twenty or thirty which were quartered in other parts of the building. It cost some exercise of the white truncheon, well seconded by the exertions of the domestics, to silence this canine clamor. To the gate, knaves, said the Saxon, hastily, as soon as the tumult was so much appeased that the dependents could hear his voice. See what tidings that horn tells us of, to announce, I ween, some her ship and robbery which has been done upon my lands. Returning in less than three minutes, a warder announced that the prior Aimer of Jorvo, and the good knight Brian de Bois Gilbert, commander of the valiant and venerable order of Knights Templars, with a small retinue, requested hospitality and lodging for the night, being on their way to a tournament which was to be held not far from Ashby de la Zouche, on the second day from the present. Aimer, the prior Aimer? Brian de Bois Gilbert? muttered Cedric. Normans both, but Norman or Saxon, the hospitality of Rotherwood must not be impeached. They are welcome, since they have chosen to halt, more welcome would they have been to have ridden further on their way, but it were unworthy to murmur for a night's lodging and a night's food. In the quality of guests, at least, even Normans must suppress their insolence. 
go, Hundebert, he added, to a sort of major domo who stood behind him with a white wand. Take six of the attendants, and introduce the strangers to the guests' lodging. Look after their horses and mules, and see their train lack nothing. Let them have change of vestments if they require it, and fire, and water to wash, and wine and ale. And bid the cooks add what they hastily can to our evening meal, and let it be put on the board when those strangers are ready to share it. Say to them, Hundebert, that Cedric would himself bid them welcome, but he is under a vow never to step more than three steps from the dais of his own hall to meet any who shares not the blood of Saxon royalty. Be gone! See them carefully tended. Let them not say in their pride, the Saxon churl has shown at once his poverty and his avarice. The major domo departed with several attendants, to execute his master's commands. The prior aimer, repeated Cedric, looking to Oswald, the brother, if I mistake not, of Giles de Malaverer, now lord of Middleham. Oswald made a respectful sign of assent. His brother sits in the seat, and usurps the patrimony, of a better race, the race of Ulfgar of Middleham. But what Norman lord doth not the same? This prior is, they say, a free and jovial priest, who loves the wine cup and the bugle horn better than bell and book. Good. Let him come, he shall be welcome. How named ye the Templar? Brian de Bois Gilbert. Bois Gilbert, said Cedric, still in the musing, half-arguing tone, which the habit of living among dependents had accustomed him to employ, and which resembled a man who talks to himself rather than to those around him, Bois Gilbert. That name has been spread wide both for good and evil. They say he is valiant as the bravest of his order, but stained with their usual vices, pride, arrogance, cruelty, and voluptuousness. A hard-hearted man, who knows neither fear of earth, nor awe of heaven. So say the few warriors who have returned from Palestine. Well, it is but for one night, he shall be welcome too. Oswald, broach the oldest wine cask. Place the best mead, the mightiest ale, the richest morat, the most sparkling cider, the most odoriferous pigments, upon the board. Fill the largest horns, Templars and abbots love good wines and good measure. Elgatha, let thy lady Rowena, know we shall not this night expect her in the hall, unless such be her especial pleasure. But it will be her especial pleasure, answered Elgatha, with great readiness, for she is ever desirous to hear the latest news from Palestine. Cedric darted at the forward damsel a glance of hasty resentment, but Rowena, and whatever belonged to her, were privileged and secure from his anger. He only replied, Silence, maiden, thy tongue outruns thy discretion. Say my message to thy mistress, and let her do her pleasure. Here, at least, the descendant of Alfred still reigns a princess. Elgatha left the apartment. Palestine, repeated the Saxon, Palestine. How many ears are turned to the tales which dissolute crusaders, or hypocritical pilgrims, bring from that fatal land? I too might ask, I too might inquire, I too might listen with a beating heart to fables which the wily strollers devise to cheat us into hospitality. But no, the son who has disobeyed me is no longer mine, nor will I concern myself more for his fate than for that of the most worthless among the millions that ever shaped the cross on their shoulder, rushed into excess and blood guiltiness, and called it an accomplishment of the will of God. He knit his brows and fixed his eyes for an instant on the ground. As he raised them, the folding doors at the bottom of the hall were cast wide, and, preceded by the major domo with his wand, and four domestics bearing blazing torches, the guests of the evening entered the apartment. Karaoke Books <laughs>